And uh, I'd like to uh, remind people that we're uh, here today uh, on Treaty 6 uh, territory, homeland of Métis. And we do care and respect the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'm uh, happy to introduce uh, William Lee here, who's the third in our uh, series, our, the MFA lecture series here. Uh, so uh, next week we have uh, Nicholas Pete. Um, at the same time, same place. Uh, William Lee is uh, uh, currently in his Master's of uh, Fine Art here at the University. His exhibition, the graduating exhibition, will be on uh, in the fall. It's coming fall. Uh, Nicholas has uh, been involved in several shows. Nicholas? William. William. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. William has been involved in several shows around town, uh, and Nuit Blanche uh, in particular uh, in 2015. He was in a group show in Toowoomba, Australia, with uh, Susan Chance, uh, part, part of her class there. Did an exchange show uh, in uh, 2015, also called Antipods. Um, he's, uh, uh, that show is also at their Geller Swift Current. Uh, he's uh, been involved at the uh, University of Saskatchewan Undergraduate Research Journal. Uh, where uh, several of his artworks were reproduced. Uh, just yesterday we had a reception for the latest issue of uh, that journal. Uh, he's been a teaching assistant in uh, sculpture and uh, he's a studio, he has been a studio technician with Andreas Buchwald, who's a graduate of this uh, department as well. And uh, William uh, talks about his, uh, uh, his process, his practices. He has an intuitive process and he's interested in material transformations, and so hopefully he'll say something about that in this presentation. So, thanks very much. Uh, I think I'm going to be brave and stand up the front. <laughs> um, uh, thanks so much for coming up to my talk today. At least it's, I know the, the weather is a little bit nicer out today, so. It is. Yeah. Um, I think I, I recognize uh, most of you here, but for those who don't know me, uh, my name is William Lee, and I'm from Saskatoon. I'm working in the, the second year of my MFA, and I mainly work in sculpture, uh, video, and photography uh, practices. And I'm finding that a lot of my work is um, quite self-reflective, and it's about my experiences. And I find I can be very introspective, and I'm a quiet person, and uh, I'm a bit of a homebody. And uh, I've been looking at this word, uh, because for me, the, uh, the home is a very important place to me, and it's my place to recharge. It's where I can think and process, and it's where I feel most creative. And I find that I almost navigate the world by the pathways to and from my home. And um, to me, this is something that has become an important part of my work. And so during my undergrad, I lived in a new housing development in Saskatoon called Evergreen. And uh, I brought up the satellite image. This is evergreen down here, and this is about where my house was. And while living in this area, I became very aware of um, these housing developments on how they're pushing closer and closer into uh, the Northeast Swale, which is a large, um, unbroken, protected area of um, prairie. Um, but I started becoming interested in these uh, housing developments. And just the other day, I brought up this satellite image, and it, 
I found it really interesting the way that this large triangular shape that is being formed on the land, I find it quite ominous. And I think it reflects the, um, at ground level too, it's quite, um, it's quite an unusual place to uh, explore. And while living here in this house, I used to wander. I would wait for all the construction crews to leave in the evening, and I would go out uh, wandering into these fields of dirt. And it's quite an, uh, an otherworldly place to explore. And I would take my camera with me, um, my SLR. Uh, these are some photos I took out in these um, kind of construction uh, fields, these development, these areas, uh, these kind of areas of land that are being developed. And uh, I was interested in these, um, the rubble and the machinery that I was coming across. There were lots of things that I had never seen before. And even walking out in this land, I had this very strong feeling like I, I shouldn't be there. Uh, I probably shouldn't have been there. Um, <laughs> but, um, and it was just a very otherworldly uh, landscape, as far as you can see, just dirt and very dead. Uh, no wildlife whatsoever. Um, I felt like I was being watched. I felt like I was in a, in a cemetery or something. Uh, and I also, I became, while wandering through uh, these areas, I became interested. It seemed like the only, there's some humor in that the only natural objects left behind were these just rocks that were left on the, on the surface of the soil. And this was actually um, a part of my BFA show. Uh, I started photographing the, the surfaces of these rocks that I found um, out, out in the soil. And I guess I found some interest in how the, the surface of these rocks, the textures, were the same as the surface of the, the landscape where, where I found them. Um, and somewhat ambiguous. And I would continually <laughs> explore these areas, and I started finding more recently, I started finding these um, these objects. Uh, I've been calling them land markers um, that had been discarded, and um, they're they're quite strange to me. And sculpturally, the way that they've been bent, and I really question what. It's very heavy metal. It's thick, and it it really makes me wonder what happened to cause these um, this metal to bend that way. If they had been, if it was from the ground shifting or if they had been run over by, um, by uh, machinery. Um, it's kind of uh, unusual to me. And I started laying them out um, almost like uh, there's something weapon-like about them, laying them out parallel to one another. They become like spears. And there's something violent about it. And speaking of. Uh, I do want to tell you uh, a small story about something that happened while uh, I was living in my evergreen home. Uh, in January 2015, there had been an extensive investigation of an organized crime in, Sask in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And this is known as Project for SETI. Does anyone remember hearing about this in the news at the time? There had been a bunch of house raids. Um, a total of 14 people had been arrested in the province on 61 charges, including drug and weapon trafficking, assault, and numerous other offenses. Police seized drugs with an estimated street value of $8 million, including methamphetamine, cocaine, fentanyl, and heroin. They had also seized over 200 weapons, thousands of rounds of ammunition, and four ballistic vests. And on that day, the police raided a total of 18 locations across Saskatchewan and Alberta, all at the exact same time, at, at 6 in the morning. And I, I'm telling you all of this because uh, my house was one of those homes that got raided by police on that day. And this is the, the door frame that they had burst through. Um, that morning um, while I was asleep in my bedroom. Um, about 10 police officers had burst into my 600 square foot basement suite um, 
armed with assault rifles. I had never seen anything like it before. Um, we later learned that the tenants upstairs had been weapon trafficking, and they had been a part of this organized crime, um, working in relation to the, the fallen saints. And um, I remember after this happening, it really changed how I felt about my home. Uh, it felt like, I remember the next morning almost expecting it to all happen all over again, and then the same thing next day. Of course, it never happened, and it wasn't rational, but it felt that way. And it felt like my house could just get burst into at any moment. But I found that after after displaying this and talking about it more, I think that, that started to help me process. Um, and I think that started to make me feel a little better about things. And moving forward into my BFA show, um, this, uh, these are casts of, um, of a rock that my, my mom had found uh, a long time ago at Manitou Beach at her cottage in the ground. And it's a sandstone that had been naturally formed. And it's quite a strange stone because it, it kind of resembles the, the Venus of Willendorf, or you know, there's something, it's very, um, there's something uh, kind of character-like about it. And um, it's always, after my mom passed away in 2011, I, I took this rock and it's something that it's always been around. It's always been a part of my childhood in the yard. I always remember it. And I started becoming interested in uh, duplicating it, seeing how closely I could uh, copy its exact uh, color and texture. So I started casting it um, using plaster, sand, and charcoal in varying, um, in varying amounts. And then I lined them up on this plinth uh, to form a gradient from gray and back into this sandy color and then back to gray. And just recently, um, I was going through some uh, old storage that I had and I found a box that had a very, uh, that had a small blue box inside it and I opened that and uh, it contained my, my mom's old rock collection. And it was interesting, lots of little, uh, little fossils and little uniquely colored uh, rocks were, were in the box. And I remembered seeing it at, when I was a child and my mom talking about each of the rocks and where they came from where, and where she traveled. Uh, I think a lot of these come from the Northwest Territories. But I started kind of working with this collection and then I've started introducing my own uh, rocks in as well. So it's sort of become like this uh, this conversation. And this is a close-up. And so, after my mom passed away in 2011, um, I inherited the, the house that I had grown up in as a child. And I lived there until I was 15. And it had been kept, since then, it had been kept as, as a rental property uh, for quite some time, about, about 10 years. And just very recently, in September, uh, me and my partner Russell decided to move into this house. And being the house that I grew up in as a child, I found that there were layers and layers of memories. And I noticed after looking through the house that a lot of things hadn't changed since I had lived there before. There was still the same carpeting, the same light fixtures, the same wallpaper. And I noticed in the carpet that there had been some impressions left from old family furniture that used to be there. 
And even after all these years, that I could still see the impressions left from those pieces of furniture. And I knew that we had to replace this carpet. It was over 30 years old. Um, and so I, I decided to, to save these, these impressions, and so I cut them out. And then I hung them on the wall, almost like, like tapestries or like paintings. And then I posted uh, photographs of, uh, of family events happening around these uh, pieces of furniture that used to exist on these um, areas of carpet. And these are some of the, the photos that I, that I posted, uh, old family photos. Uh, both of these happen to be birthdays uh, around the, these uh, old pieces of furniture. And I think um, after being in this house, I've started to uh, think um, a lot about memory and um, childhood and family. And I started to, um, I guess I, I was thinking about, I wanted to learn more about myself uh, and my ancestry. And uh, I'm curious, uh, a show of hands, how many people are familiar of these at home DNA kits? Okay, so, okay, so a lot of us. Um, so how this works is you can order one of these kits online, it arrives at your house, you provide a sample of saliva, you mail it back to the lab, and in a few weeks they'll send you an ancestry composition. And so I took advantage of a, a Black Friday sale and I, <laughs> I purchased the 23andMe kit and uh, it arrived and uh, I did the test, I sent it off, and I received my results on the morning of Christmas Eve. And at first, everything kind of looked as I expected. Um, I knew that I was mostly uh, British, uh, and maybe Irish. Uh, I thought I had heard of some Scandinavian in my family, um, I knew that I had a, a great-grandmother that was Jewish, uh, so that was nice to see in my results. But 23andMe also has a system where it will match you with uh, close DNA relatives who have also taken the test. And this is where things start to get strange <laughs> for me. Um, so I clicked on that page, and I was matched with four half-siblings. Um, but it didn't make any sense, because I started looking through their profiles, and they're all from different states. One is from Wisconsin, one from Vermont, um, Minnesota, and one uh, from Ontario. And they're all at least one or a few years younger than me. Um, so I couldn't figure out how that could be possible. So I kind of just thought, well, how accurate can that be? So I put it away, but it bugged me. And uh, I kept going back to it. I really wondered why, why does it show these people uh, matched with me? So I decided to send each one of them a message. I wrote, hey there, I just got my results back on here, and it says we're half-siblings. Do you think this stuff is accurate? And um, the first person responded to me. His name is Daniel, and he said, Yes, I just found out yesterday, so it's new to me too. And I've been in contact with the others. Do you know that you're the result of artificial insemination? This may be a kind of a surprise, 
<laughs> um, and uh, that, that was a pretty big surprise. <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm 26, and in my entire life, there's never been any indication of being donor conceived. And so, and it actually, to be honest, it almost felt too good to be true, uh, <laughs> because because I I never had a, a a strong relationship with my father growing up, and I grew up as an only child. So, if this is true, this changes a lot for me and my my identity and what I know of myself. And uh, so. I needed some additional confirmation, so I did. Uh, I sent an email to my to my dad, telling him what had happened and what I had found, and he he confirmed it and uh, gave me an explanation. Uh, so uh, then I did get in touch with uh, with my half siblings on Facebook. We started a group chat, uh, and they filled me in on information. Uh, it turns out that the donor, who is my biological father is an architect living in North Dakota and uh, yeah so it's uh, had a pretty big impact on me it's been a lot to process and I have a feeling it's going to have an impact on my work mm -hmm. as well and on the house I'm living in as well mm -hmm. I started looking, in my house, I started looking at um, this wallpaper and the staircase, and that's my dog, Ernest, um, <laughs> watching me while I was uh, working with my camera equipment. Um, but looking at this wallpaper, I think in the beginning when I was working with the carpet, it felt more like I was attempting to, to save things and archive, but I think that's starting to change. I think um, it's um, becoming more about, about, um, about altering and rewriting rather than saving and archiving. And so I've started removing this wallpaper, finding interest in how the house might change, and cutting out the flowers, um, and then finding ways of what, after I cut out these flowers, what do I do with them, and thinking about ways of organizing them, putting all the flowers together, putting all the stems together, putting all the leaves together, and it's like some attempt at making sense of something that existed before, but it's different now. And now, living in this house, thinking about how I lived there before as a child with one story, but now living there again with a very different story, and trying to figure out how does that change me and how does that change my house? <laughs> okay, so I, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to answer questions. Yeah. So um, what really um, started to become really clear and apparent to me is just the way that you've been working with serializations of things like these um, collections of almost duplicates or duplicates that are slightly different and it just struck me that that's so similar how DNA works and your siblings are now these kind of semi duplicates that you're working but my, my question is is more in terms of while you're while you're doing this what what's going through your mind as you're excavating the flowers and and again I see the connection between like DNA sexuality flower flowers deflowering and all of these kind of language around that so I'm just curious about your process when you're sitting doing these things, cutting the carpet, doing the excavating of the flowers, what, what you're kind of thinking about, and if that serialization is something that you're consciously working with. Mm -hmm. 
So with the with the flower wallpaper, it's um, this is becoming a bit of a durational uh, project, and that there's a large uh, quantity of wallpaper, and there's a lot of flowers to cut out. So it's really becoming something that is uh, meditative uh, for me, and I think just that process of cutting out something that existed before and then organizing it, it really uh, reflects um, something that, that is going on for me personally as well and that uh, it's been a lot for me to, to process this and uh, it almost feels like I've been, it's like my brain has been rewiring itself. The, the dad I grew up with uh, is very, very different from uh, the, the donor, my biological father I'm finding. Uh, so and that's having a, a large uh, impact on my my identity. So it's almost like this other way of um, of, uh, of processing that, that information. And this, because you've been working with the serialization for so long, what is it about that process of repetition and, and multiples that really attracts you? Mm -hmm. I think it really by by multiplying an object, it um, for me it it gives it a sort of a higher uh, significance that it that it's been multiplied. It's also a lot of my a lot of times that I have, uh, like for example the, the the sandstone rocks that I was, it was um, more of um, uh, almost um, like a like this trial and error to try to re reproduce something as close as possible as I can, and so producing a, a quantity uh, um, that way out of uh, experimentation. Just a couple observations, like when I see you doing this, I'm also aware that you're doing a removal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're keeping the removed paper, because that reminds me of what you did with the carpet. You know, there it was just a geometric cut. But both of those are kind of like the skin of the house that you inhabited, right? With the walls and the floor. Interesting with an architect, biological dad. Um, but just, yeah, that I think those materials might be interesting too, as much as what you're removing. Mm -hmm. And then, in terms of your talk and you, the sort of two dramatic points in it are your story about the police invasion in your previous house, and then that's an invasion that's physical, and this is like a psychological mm -hmm. kind of invasion. So they're both like stories of disruption, and yet you're calling your talk homebody, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a strong identification with home, mm -hmm. and then your narrative is these two very um, disruptive in very different ways storage so it's like a lot to process when you're a very homebody kind of person yeah. right so it, just kind of a couple observations in your talk I didn't you didn't talk about a lot of work but you pieces you talked about seem to develop a bit of a narrative mm -hmm. that yeah yeah I think um, out, of, out of the works that I, I selected to show I was um, interested in works that did have um, uh, that related to home because uh, I think I, that's something I've, I've discovered more recently is that home is a very important uh, part of my work and that most of my work uh, does seem to uh, relate to home in some way or the area around my home or, or some personal experience that has happened to me. Um, I noticed that uh, in retrospect I was thinking that the breaking down that door was almost foreshadowing of something massive that's going to happen to your life, so that's interesting. But I'm curious about, um, you haven't really, you've alluded to, but you haven't really talked about what your MFA thesis might be. Have you, has this just basically like blown apart everything that you were previously well, doing and, and now you're reconfiguring ideas? Yeah, this has put a bit of a spin on things. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I would definitely say I, I'm, I'm currently reconsidering uh, uh, some things that I've been working on. <coughs> Bit of a question mark at the moment, but but it's developing. I think. Cool. Yeah, I'm not sure if you realize it. Those metal objects that you were showing there mm -hmm. are actually markers, mm -hmm. rather markers that identify where the home is, where the mm -hmm. location is. Now you disconnected the marker from the actual identity object. Uh -huh. Really interesting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, that is. Uh, I didn't know they were specifically marking the area. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. If you want to know more about them, I can talk about them. It's part of what I used to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Oh, <laughs> that's good information. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, I'm just thinking too about your interest in archaeology, which is how you've talked about it sometimes, you know, like specimens and rocks and stuff like that. 
and now there's like this whole level of archaeology where it's like yeah, more may, of a may. DNA and like a more subtle level, personal level. Mm -hmm. so there's some interesting themes that are coming together maybe in your work too, but in new ways. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes, I am just kind of uh, reflecting on, on the, what I find very interesting is um, the subject of home and we bring it in and we were discussing uh, it yesterday, yesterday in our yeah. class with John and, um, and that was, uh, I mean how interesting it is, you know, that uh, this home that we are finding and this I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm just going to say, you know, this, this home that we are finding that is always fluctuating and in the process of being demolished, mm -hmm. if it's uh, physically or psychologically, you know, and, uh, and um, the persistence of finding what home is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just find it very interesting and in your work and uh, this reflection in your work and, you know, in the work of, of some of us. Um, is it sharing? I, I agree, and I've also got a very half-formed kind of thoughts here, but you know, looking what you presented here because it seems so strong here. What you're, the material that you're dealing with here, and uh, a number of things occur to me. Uh, one is like you know the point that uh, Lisa brought up about the uh, the serial process that you're involved with, and that evokes for me. Um, you know, a, a key text of Walter Benjamin's the work of art and age of mechanical reproduction mm -hmm. and how he talks about, you know, the uh, relationship of the original, the source, to the mechanically reproduced object, which you did with your mother's found thing. And was that a way of, you know, getting closer to your mother or farther away? And it seems like it was kind of doing both, right? Because Benjamin talks about uh, the uh, the uh, original having a kind of an aura that's uh, that's eaten up when it's mechanically reproduced, and I do find a kind of a, an overall general strain through your work of um, some kind of alienation from these things, and that may be a kind of a, a backhanded way of getting closer to things. And of course, the other theme. Uh, of home in your work it also brings up, you know, a, a, a Sigmund Freud's uh, discussion of the uncanny, right? And how he talks about home as, a, or the unhomelike, unheimlich is what he, is the German translation for uncanny. And, the, and it's a short text, it's a really wonderful text because he, he describes the uncanny by way of a, he starts out with a dictionary definition. Of, of, of that, and in fact, as he goes through all the definitions of home, he gets to its very opposite, of unhomelike. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps those two things are necessarily bound together if you're trying to sort of get close to something, and maybe it's also about the impossibility of really getting to that. Point. Just to respond to that is an interest with, with Benjamin is sure. this idea that the multiple takes away that the, the aura, but I find also, and we see this a lot in digital technology, that it also substantiates the original and it creates a new reality. So all of a sudden you have this item that's now grown larger than itself and it's like this this confronting almost like army arm for lack of a, of a, of a better of a better term. Yes. So there's this paradox there as well. Yes. Given the magnitude of the results that you receive from DNA analysis, if you, were you ever attempted to sec, seek a second opinion or a third opinion? <laughs> oh, to, to confirm. Mm -hmm. um, to I, confirm I, or to deny? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't. I, I've considered it. Though, I, um, after, when I first received my results, I was pretty, I was really questioning how, how accurate can this be. I, I definitely needed some additional uh, confirmation. And so I had um, sent an email to uh, the, the dad that I, I grew up with, and he, um, he sent me a, a confirmation that I was donor conceived, and he sent an explanation of that to me. So I think, um, I think for now, that, that's enough of confirmation. I think maybe in the future I may, I might look for more, but this this seems to be um, it seems to be accurate. It may be 
even allow you to broaden your sense of home and mm -hmm. ancestry. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that you managed, you cultivated a curiosity around home, you know, given a home invasion, a total disruption to your identity. Um, you know, maybe most or would be adverse to their home, wanted to be as far away as possible from their home, that you really cultivated this curiosity and um, it's time to I could see where you could rename this whole thing in search of a home. In other words, you're not sure where you are or where you belong or where you belong. And so you're mining information that's available to you and to give you a better sense of secure homeness. That's just my interpretation. Yeah, since since moving into the house, it do, it does feel a bit like it's become like a like an archaeological site for me. It's a place to to explore and to, to look into the past mm -hmm. and to find things that still exist there now, and then thinking about how will they change moving forward. It's as if you're living within your artwork mm -hmm. that is never going to end. <laughs> Like that term, that archaeological, I think uh, in the process of renewal of ourselves, we are always in between the ruins and building out right? things like that. Right. What, is, what is the difference um, between the um, photography and um, the materials that you're using? Or how do you think you're operating? I think um, often with photography, I'll often photography for me is often about documentation of something. So, in uh, earlier in my presentation, showing the photographs of um, of um, the the rebel and, and the machinery in those um, those um, in those fields where the land being development. To me, it's more of a way to um, Document, uh, document something, a place, uh, an area. Mm -hmm. But you seem so good at it, and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, those are beautiful they're, photographs. Yeah. I think, yeah, there, there's an aesthetic component to it as well. And the black and white, and they remind me of you know uh, the the Becker photographs that uh, you know from the the 70s, Hilla and uh, what, what's that? Uh, Baron. The, their photographs of uh, you know the uh, uh, water towers because they're very carefully composed and there's something that is kind of ominous about that machinery that's just kind of left there and the barren landscape they're, they're, they're very beautiful photographs so it seems like it's it's more than sort of personal documentation I'd like to see them exhibited sometime I mean they're really very beautiful I'm assuming that you no longer have this devastation of being in the Devastation. Well, this new suburb of being in the Are you still I'm, there? But now, I'm, I, w I was living in Evergreen before, uh -huh. uh, where that was, but now I, I've moved and I'm, I'm living in the, the house where I Like in an older neighborhood where there isn't in a, a stuff? Yeah, in, a, in an older neighborhood. So I, it, like, I was watching my Evergreen. Like I'm actually seeing that process happening in this house. Mm -hmm. okay? So like when they take, you know, she can just kind of clip off all of the glass. That's kind of what was happening with with the carpet and kind of just sort of diluting the wall of life forms is mm -hmm. happening here. So it's like it's kind of coming back in the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a good observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to extend that point, there is, is there a violence in what you're doing? Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever had to say it. Yeah. Well, it's almost, it could almost 
be like memorial too. Mm -hmm. That's a nice. the preservation of the flowers and the I wondered if that, I think that's what Terry's talking about, like the relationship to the larger site of the prairie that you started with. Because um, then it focused in more on home. I think those photographs that Marcus was referring to, they made me think as well of early Wanda Coop paintings of the prairie with these big silos and kind of industrial things placed on them, and they had almost a, like a surreal quality to them this isolated object in this so-called empty landscape. So just just thinking about some of those ideas and maybe things to think about in terms of how home relates to the larger site and to the ecology of the site. And working with that idea of memory and, and in some way the kind of barrenness, I'm reminded of um, some work by Barb Hunt where she um, would go to graveyards and you know all the plastic flowers that people put on grave sites. Yeah. So over a period of time, uh, they deteriorate and they blow away and they're gathered around the edge. And so she would pick all of those individual flowers and then she would wash them and she would recreate them and put them into installations. Mm -hmm. and, and each sort of flower held you know, quite a lot of history. And, Significance, and then when she accumulated them together, which is what you're going to be doing here, um, it took on just this amazing kind of evocative quality. And it seems to me that that's so much a part of what your work is all about: is this kind of reflective, evocative zone. Any other questions? Thank you.